Ahoy! Joe Buddy Hambone here, and I'm back again with a brand new coupon code from our friends over at Noble Night Games. That code is VRPG21, and it is good from February the 15th all the way through March 31st, and it's good for 10% off any size order. You heard me right, Noble Night is back, bring in the heat with 10% off any size order. Good from the 15th of February all the way through March 31st. Never been a better time than now to pick up some games. And hey, if you got some older games that you need to clear out to make space for those new games, Noble Knight's got you covered with a killer trading program. You can learn more about that at noblenight.com. And in the meantime, don't forget if you're shopping at Noble Knight to use our code VRPG21 to get 10% off any size order from February 15th through the 31st of March. From our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. He refers to the loft on the second floor of the clubhouse as the Dark Tower, Stu Horvath. It's the Red Tower. I've heard it both ways. All I know (laughs) is that men our age should not be climbing ladders, and you have to take one to get there, so there you go. Oh, man, I was up on a ladder. I was real high on a ladder the other day, hanging this awesome banner that Skinner, the artist Skinner, made of D&D monsters. And uh, it's like a six-foot ladder, and I had to be up like, you never go on that top one. That top one is not a step. But I was on the next one down, and it was terrifying. Well, besides living dangerously, how are you doing today, Sto? Pretty good. How are you? I can't complain. Today is an awesome episode because we are going to talk about the Dark Tower. And at the end of the episode, we have another awesome indie RPG elevator pitch brought to you by our friends at Exalted Funeral. And this week, we are going to talk to Amanda Lee Frank, creator of You Got a Job on the Trash Barge and Vampire Cruise. Yeah, that's super good stuff. And before we get to that, why don't we get into the action? Stu, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about the Dark Tower? So Dark Tower represents for me kind of the height of Judges Guild's creative awesomeness. So Judges Guild is really responsible for kind of establishing what we expect out of Dungeons and Dragons materials, which is weird because they're not Dungeons and Dragons. They're not TSR. They're the third party guys who kind of fill the gap that TSR wasn't filling. TSR, we've talked about this on the podcast already, wasn't really interested in providing content for players to use. They assumed that players were going to make up their own stuff. So Judges Guild was one of a couple of companies in the mid 70s who was just like, well, no, we're going to make our own stuff. They did the first city setting, City State of the Invincible Overlord. And they sort of established one of the first campaign settings, which is the Wilderlands of High Fantasy, both in 76. Tegel Manor is another sort of like a proto mega dungeon right there in the beginning, establishing all this stuff. But the thing is, by modern standards, those products, while cool and gonzo and interesting, they're not sexy. They don't have a lot of art. There's something missing. But a couple of years later, 1979, they have this fantastic designer on board, Janelle Jaquez, and she just delivers like banger after banger, man. <laughs> Love it. So Dark Tower, I'm not sure which comes first, if Dark Tower came out first or if Caverns of Thracia comes out first in 1979. They are both amazing modules that they're super important. And both of these modules to have come out in the same year is insane. And what's even crazier is that Keep on the Borderland and Snake Pipe Hollow, which are sort of like the epitome of like the 70s D&D adventure. And she beats them both to market with what is essentially the same thing. All of these modules kind of fit the same template of like having a vast underground system of caves and it's the Caves of Chaos in Keep on the Borderlands. It's the Caverns of Chaos in Snake Pipe Hollow for RuneQuest. And it's the Caverns of Thracia for Judges Guild. They are all sort of like the same big dungeon, you know, with a small village that you could use as a base. And just the feel of all three of these modules is very much the same. I don't think anybody's ripping anybody off. 
you know, I just want to be clear about that. I think that this is a natural destination. If you look at everything that, that came before it, there are smart people thinking along the same lines and they got to the same destination at about the same time. But Janelle Jaquez is the person who got to the finish line first. It's a little unfair, I think, that Keep on the Borderlands gets all of the credit as being like one of the best Dungeons and Dragons adventures ever because it's the same basic thing as a lot of Janelle's other work, which came first. There was a Dragon or Dungeon Magazine poll about 10 years ago, which ranked the 50 best D&D modules. You know, like lists like that are stupid. But Dark Tower is the only non-TSR Dungeons & Dragons module to make it onto that list, which gives you a, an idea of the esteem that exists for this product. And it's awesome. It's a massive book printed on... <laughs> you know that stuff... It's not quite newsprint, but when we were kids, you could get like pads of like sketch paper that was really oh, yeah. low quality paper. That's what Judges Guild prints on. <laughs> Although the kind of stuff that was the best that if you had silly putty and you ran it over the top of it, you'd be able to peel it off and get exactly what was on the page. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting because you do have three competitive companies all working on a very similar thing and yet coming out with things that are alike in a lot of ways but in their own way, very different. You know, they say that the chords C, D, E minor, G, they're used in most hit songs. Mm -hmm. Like most hit songs have those four chords in one progression or another. And then when you look at it, you have three competing companies doing it, pretty much kind of playing the same chords, but you know, only one person gets more than a feeling. The other company <laughs> gets Cut Your Hair by Pavement, and then the final company gets Every Rose Has Its Thorn, all hits in their own ways, all hits at different levels, but a hit nonetheless. And this is a really good way to think of it because all of those hits appeal to different people for different reasons. So like up to this point of time, the same sort of people are all playing you know, Dungeons and Dragons role-playing games, right? But after this point in time, late 79, 80, these hits hit, right? But right. they all appeal to different people and they bring new people in. And suddenly there's like this gigantic rainbow of possibility that opens up in the 80s. There's a couple more moments of synchronicity amongst the products. And you can sort of see where like some people were thinking the same thing at the same time. The way that sort of cyberpunk and... Shadowrun come out sort of around the same time and Rifts and Torg come out around the same time. But overall, there's just so many products. It, there's an explosion of stuff that you can't really see it anymore. And part of it is just because all of these things bring in new people that have differing mindsets. And it makes the whole hobby more uh, rich and diverse, which is cool. But Dark Tower is super weird, even by the even by the standards of like wacky D and D stuff that happens. It's like it's almost like a kinder, gentler Tomb of Horrors in a lot of ways. Really, there's a lot of like clever D and D brain going on, weaponizing stuff in unique ways. There are so many objects and written words that have the spell invisibility cast on them in this game. Oh man. <laughs> Which is just like, oh, that's really clever the first time. But once you get like multiple of these things, it's like, how do you handle a treasure chest that's invisible? Like, do they ever find it? Like, what if they do find it? How, how do you play that out? Like, I, I don't know how to handle that as the GM, but I think it's super clever to make a piece of paper and all the writing is invisible ink. That's funny. That's hilarious. And I think the answer here is your toe will be the first thing to find that treasure chest. <laughs> <laughs> and then you will say ow a bunch and then have to figure out what it is you just kicked. Yeah. There's a bunch of teleportation that you don't know happens, which I think is always a good gag. Like you walk through the door and like you don't realize that you're like in a totally different building now. I love that. <laughs> it's also a very weird space, even though it's called Dark Tower. This is one of the first modules that has like a backstory. So like there's a tower to Mitra, who's a good deity, and Mitra's frenemy god set like who hates mitra but like they're also like buddies in a weird way well in so much as set wants to be neighbors so set's really jealous of mitra's tower so set grows his own tower out of the ground right next to it right and like tries to have his followers you know kill mitra's followers this all results in a giant landslide which buries both towers years later treasure hunters come to the area and get corrupted by set's influence and found this village that's above the ruins and all of these people who live there are evil and want to destroy that tower so like the people who you know adventurers who come in there they like they help them until they don't want to help them anymore and then they kind of ambush them there's weird people like one of the bad people living in the area is like this halfling mage which already 
weird. But he also has like a menagerie of monsters in the complex. It's, it's just cool and weird and strange. Like in that way that like nothing really makes sense. You're not going to win an Oscar, you know, <laughs> with Dark Tower adapting it anyway, because there's just so much stuff that like just doesn't make a kind of dramatic sense or narrative sense, but it's fun to play. And I think that says a lot about creativity in general, not even so much back in the day, but just in general, where sometimes as much as we have reached, I think, the zenith of it has to be a consistent, tight story, it has to have all the beats that hit A, B, C, and D, you have to do this, 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 and this. Like, there's still so much to be said about throwing a bunch of shit against the wall and seeing what sticks, or just throwing stuff in there because you know it's going to be fun, which is the spirit of what all of this was founded upon. Fun, right? And I think that's cool, man. I think that's special that even in something that was a big release at the time, and maybe they didn't know which way these releases were going to go going forward, they just hit the button and said, you know what? Let's make this more about fun and people having a wild time at the table and really pushing the boundaries of what you could do with Dungeons & Dragons, which is a very rigid set of rules. Yeah, this is totally fun, totally gonzo. I think that maybe now more than ever, if you were to throw this at the party, like no one would know what to make of this. Your new to D&D 5e group expects a certain amount of like, you know, modern polish, which in a lot of cases is predictable and, and slightly boring, but like in a good way, because it's giving you what you want. Dark Tower never gives you what you want, <laughs> but it gives you stuff that keeps you guessing in a really interesting and exciting way. And it's not just a dungeon crawl. I mean, it is very much a hack and slash in a lot of ways, or it can be a uh, huge dungeon complex and lots of NPCs. Almost everything has a name and a motivation, which basically equates to everything in the dungeon is a faction of one at least. And then there's a couple factions that are, you know, multiple players. So like you can kind of get in there and play diplomat and forge alliances and, and kind of turn the inhabitants against each other in some ways especially the evil ones. There's a lot of strange folks who make for temporary allies in the complex, which is really weird and extremely unusual for the time. I guess it's something that, that does kind of come up in both Snake Pipe Hollow and Keep Out the Borderlands. But like before this, you know, like you're looking at the Giants modules, right? And Descent uh, into the Depths of the Earth. There's not really a whole lot of like making friends in those adventures. Oh, no, you're running for your life constantly. <laughs> yeah. or just trying to kill whatever steps in front of you. Yeah. This whole sort of like faction crawling is something that's become more and more important to sort of game design, I think. Like some of the best stuff that has come out in recent years embraces sort of that idea of faction crawling, you know, navigating the complex political structures of a bunch of different people at, who are at odds with each other. Hot Springs Island comes to mind, which is, you know, combines hex crawling and this idea of like multiple factions. And it's great because the more you allow players to kind of like make alliances and kind of like get into the thick of it with all of these NPCs, the more likely it is that it's all going to blow up in kind of a tremendous and, you know, unexpected way. Like that's the best part. I was saying to somebody recently that the most gratifying thing that you can do as a GM is to kind of like have a social situation sort of sketched out that the players sort of expect and you th you just lob some sort of unexpected grenade into that social situation. If you do it right and at the perfect moment, that whole session will be the players just dealing with that one thing and you kind of get to sit back and it's the best kind of television, right? <laughs> Yeah, you, you know? get to be the viewer for once. Yeah, and they're, they're just there kind of like doing their thing and you you maybe have to make a ruling or two, but mostly they're entertaining you. And I, that's <laughs> there's a lot of potential for that in Dark Tower. Love it. Stu, do you have any final thoughts on Dark Tower? Yes, I do. The interesting thing about Dark Tower is that almost immediately within the next year, Janelle Jaquais and Rudy Kraft come around and kind of make a parody version of Dark Tower for RuneQuest called Duck Tower. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Aside of that joke, like Jaquez does the cover art for both. And Dark Tower is this great, iconic look up at a giant statue of Set. And it's got, you know, nice uh, sort of like a almost aqua green 
coloring. Legendary Duck Tower is the same thing, except like the giant statue has like a duck face. <laughs> so it's like an ancient Egyptian duck. It's so good. But I mean, aside of like the obvious comic relief of the ducks, they play it straight for the rest of like, it's just like, oh, we're doing ducks. But like after the, after they get off the initial like twist, they play it totally straight. And it's actually a really fantastic RuneQuest dungeon crawl on par with, I think, the Dark Tower and uh, Caverns of Thracia, which we got to do an episode on Caverns of Thracia too. Super important. Absolutely. But today's Dark Tower Day. But yeah, ducks. It all comes back to ducks. I have learned so much about ducks working on this book, but that's a story for another day. We're going to do a, a whole episode on ducks. Absolutely. Because for Vintage RPG, it all comes back to ducks. <laughs> so before we go home on this episode, we are going to make a quick little pit stop. We have an awesome interview with Amanda Lee Frank, creator of You Got a Job on the Trash Barge in Vampire Cruise, here to have a wee chat with us for the Exalted Funeral Indie RPG Elevator Pitch. So without further ado, here's Amanda Lee Frank. So hey, Amanda, how's it going? It's going as good as can be hoped. That's all we can really ask for these days is as good as it can be hoped. We are so excited to talk about you. Stu was a very big fan of You Got a Job in the Garbage Barge. I've seen your artwork. I've loved your artwork. And I popped so hard when you announced Vampire Cruise on Kickstarter. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Vampire Cruise, which just wrapped up? Vampire Cruise is a terrible vacation that you can take <laughs> your friends on. Uh, they will be swathed in luxury. As they embark on this cruise and as time passes, more and more horrible things will happen and they will have to decide whether they will simply sip cocktails by the pool and watch other people disappear or if they will make friends and take up arms and try to either defeat or gang up together with or, I don't know, go to parties with a <laughs> lot of vampires that I have made up. I love everything about this. I love everything about this. And our friend Derek was telling us about it a little bit. Derek Kinsman, who is a fantastic, talented artist. He was like, oh, you have no idea. This thing is going to be great. And then I saw it for the first time. And just by title alone, I was sold. Seeing you involved sold me even more. And when I heard the concept, I'm like, well, man, I could probably like sit poolside and, you know, have a drink during the daytime and be safe as churches and get a reasonably good night's sleep reading a murder mystery book while people are getting murdered on the deck. <laughs> it's I made this game to play with my like high school friends over Zoom while we're all in quarantine. And I wanted it to be like cathartic and also be a real vacation. So it's very luxurious on a cruise and you can kill ev evil vampires. So it's, it provides all of your needs, I think. <laughs> as a role player and as as a gm for the game you get to pretend to be just a swath of weird evil people and it's incredibly fun it's very fulfilling to run this game why are the vampires on the cruise well like imagine you're a vampire and it's probably kind of dicey for you to travel. Like you read Dracula, you remember all the trouble he had to go to. So some enterprising young vampires, they bought a cruise ship, they put together a really like fantastic vampire deck in there with all of the things that a vampire might need. And then they also sold tickets to regular humans so that the vampires would have something for dinner. They're enterprising vampires, I love it. They're entrepreneurs. <laughs> Lestat on the Lido deck. Yeah. <laughs> They're entrepreneurs and disruptors, and you can murder them. Because <laughs> they are evil. Isn't that the definition of a disruptor, though? Yes. They are, by their nature, vampires. Yes, this is very much, like, not subtext. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's amazing. I backed it instantly. I was I loved So You Got a Job on the Garbage Barge so much that it was an instant buy. Uh, thanks. So the Kickstarter has wrapped up for it. Where will people be able to pick it up once it's actually out on the market? So the Kickstarter is totally funded. It's going to be, I gave it a really long like deadline so that I would have plenty of time to make it really beautiful. I've got somebody, Mike Anderson of Penicillin Zine is doing a layout. It's going to be gorgeous. 
So hopefully end of summer, June, July, something like that, it'll be out and people will be able to get it at Exalted Funeral. They'll be able to get it on my itch page, which is Amanda Lee at itch.io.com. Uh, where you can also get the garbage barge and probably in some other places. So later this summer, keep an eye out. It'd be great for your Halloween gaming. Yeah, you have another project coming up too. Is that coming out this year? And does it involve a boat of some kind? It doesn't have a boat. <laughs> it's my first non-boat game. Very exciting. So I got in Games Omnivorous, who make beautiful, really exciting things, invited me to pitch a game for their Manifestus Omnivorous series, which has a bunch of like cool requirements that you have to fulfill in order to like, you know, follow the manifesto. It's about eating stuff. So my game is going to be called Mouth Brew. Basically, it's a, mostly a bestiary. You're scientists, you've signed on to a dubious expedition to collect specimens up in the mountains, and you get there, and there is a big glass uh, biosphere that is melted out of a glacier, and inside of this biosphere, as many horrible animals as I could think of, <laughs> and have because you can only use 6,666 words, ah. and I am like, I'm like right up against it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But they're, I made them really horrible. They're really bad. They're really bad animals. And I'm going to draw every one of them. So it's going to be very, very beautiful or ugly. It's going to be really ugly. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I know Stu is looking forward to it too. Anything and everything you draw is always so amazing. And we are so grateful to have you on tonight to pitch your vampire cruise and then the 6,666 word monster book. Oh my gosh, it's going to be so exciting. Well, it's been amazing having you on the show tonight, Amanda. Where can our listeners find you and where can they find your books? You guys can find me on Twitter. I'm at Annabelle underscore Lee. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Amanda Lee Frank. You can find my books on Exalted Funeral. I've also uh, on Itch if you want a PDF and Amanda Lee on Itch eo.com i believe there is also four rogues trading if you're in canada they are also currently um, carrying the garbage barge so you can have it sent right to you in canada from canada well amanda that is so cool now for people who are fans of your art is there anything else that you're working on that people would be interested in hearing about yeah there is another kickstarter um, that funded uh derek kinsman in the light of the faded world, it's about small animals living in the ruins of human society, and I'll be doing all of the illustrations for that. It's going to be beautiful. Um, Thetic Seer is also working on some text for that. That's really exciting, and someday, hopefully, really someday soon, um, Scrap Princess has got a book coming out that it's finally in layout, and I did a bunch of pictures for it like years ago. It's going to be gorgeous. It's like a cyberpunk thing, and it's amazing. Awesome. Well, we are very excited to see all of that. Thank you so much again for coming on the show tonight and being a part of our Indie RPG Elevator Pitch brought to you by our friends over at Exalted Funeral. And with that, this was another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can the people find you? They can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG talking about cool zines like the ones that Amanda makes. Yes. Daily, every day. Every day, finding more zines and RPGs and musty old things to throw on the Instagram feed every day. Trying to keep that word count low, failing every single time, <laughs> but in a good way. Yeah. You could find me on the Twitter at Handbreaker. I tweet about board games. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons and other RPGs. You can follow my day-to-day -day adventures in podcasting and in life over on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire. If you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. And if you really like the show, think about becoming our patron over at patreon.com slash vintage RPG. We've got early release episodes. We've got a killer Discord community that we'd love for you to be a part of. Stu has got an amazing behind-the-scenes look at the book he's writing. I've got behind-the-scenes looks at 321 Action, my RPG, patreon.com slash vintage RPG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 